So occasionally, uh, people will come up to me, and, and uh, they have ideas for sermons that they would like to hear me preach, and um, so I decided to extend an invitation to everybody and uh, have you guys submit ideas for sermons. So we had uh, little sheets that, that we've had for the last couple months, and so I want to uh, thank everybody for filling those out. I appreciate all the, the sheets that were filled out. Uh, uh, just want to say, unfortunately, I, I, we don't have time to do all of those uh, that, that you wrote down. And so I just want to say, um, if I'm not doing what you wrote down, it's not necessarily that I didn't like the idea. Um, I kind of ended up going with m- the most common themes that I ha- had people write about. And so um, yours wasn't a, a bad idea. It just didn't make the final cut on this time. Maybe we'll do it again later. Um, so one theme that came up several times in, in various forms uh, was this idea of overcoming sin. And, or, you know, why do people get stuck in sin? How can you get out of sin? And, um, you know, some specific things came up like uh, illegal drugs or um, getting drunk or being controlled by money. And so, but really, you could fill in the blank with whatever sin you know, each of us tends to to struggle with. And so uh, let me just say as we we start off today, if you have this all perfected, um, you should come up here and and preach instead of me. And and because I am definitely not perfect, and uh, as always is the case, or at least frequently, um, I'm preaching to myself too. So um, just hear that as we get started here today. We are in, in a journey together. Uh, we are really we're kind of a group of imperfect people that God has brought together uh, on this journey. And so um, today we're talking about sin. And, and, and sin is, is frustrating, isn't it? It, it, it just is. And it, it's been frustrating mankind since Adam and Eve first succumbed to it in the, in the Garden of Eden so long ago. And Paul wrote this book of Romans in the New Testament. And it's kind of Paul's book of theology. And in the midst of talking about all these kind of deep topics, he, he brings up the problem of sin. And um, in Romans chapter 7, he, he's kind of talking about how frustrating sin is. And, and even from, from a personal standpoint, that he has struggled with it and he has problems with it. And so I, I want to pick it up in, in Romans chapter 7, verse 15. And you kind of get this, this sense of what, what Paul is talking about. Romans seven fifteen. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the the law that is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Sin is frustrating, isn't it? Man, you would think, okay, I'm I'm a Christian now. I shouldn't have to struggle with these things anymore. I should be past this. So why? Why do we still struggle? And, and, And we just... We, we know sometimes we shouldn't do this, and, and, and yet we end up doing this. And, and that's what Paul's talking about. It's like we know, but we still do it. Now, this, let me say this. This is, as we talk today, this isn't an excuse to keep on sinning, okay? Uh, sometimes we, it's easy to start to get the attitude, well, I'm just going to throw up my hands because I, I, I'm going to sin, so... Why even bother with trying not to? Um, And so that's not what I'm saying. Paul is just pointing out here that the the sinful nature is very powerful. And and let me say this too. Uh, Sin is a battle that we will face for the rest of our lives. And and if if we fight that battle on our own, if we're just trying to, oh, I'm going to hunker down and fight this, you will eventually fail. Okay, so you can't do it by yourself over time. Uh, we need God. Uh, and we, have, we all have this sinful nature uh, within us. We have this tendency towards sin. 
And, and unfortunately, that doesn't go away when we become Christians. Now, the penalty does go away because of what Jesus did on the cross. Okay, so that's the good thing. But the tendency does not go away. But hopefully, uh, through our growth process of becoming a, a disciple of, of Jesus Christ, you know, we gradually uh, start to get this tendency to sin more under control. And, and as we grow closer to Christ, we start acting more like Christ did and start living more like Christ. And so, uh, but we have to realize that this tendency to sin is always going to be there. And, and so we need to, with God's help, do our very best to try to overcome the sin that, that we're struggling with in our lives. And so I came up uh, today with my uh, list of top ten ways to help overcome sin. And so these are on the back of your bulletins if you want to follow along and fill in the blanks. Um, but let's start working our way through them. Top ten ways to overcome sin. First of all, run from it. Run from it, okay? Don't try to fight it. Run from it. Do everything you can to get away from it. Second Timothy 2.22 addresses this. It says, flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So flee your evil desires, okay? That, that means sin. Let's get away from them. I have this as the number one thing in case you guys tune out later. Okay, so, so while you're still paying attention, I want you to, to, to think about this, to get away from it. Okay, if, if your house caught on fire, uh, you don't stay there and kind of mull over your options, do you? You know, well, you know, this is kind of hot, but I, I think maybe I'll be okay. Um, yeah, I'll just kind of see what happens here. Right? No, you, you get out of there, right? If your house is on fire, you get away from it. As fast as you can. When I was growing up, I, I lived on a gravel road out in the country. And when I was really little, I barely can remember it, my mom and I went on a walk. And uh, we walked by this house that had um, bees. They had beehives. They, you know, raised bees. And for some reason, they were all stirred up that day. And so as we walked by, they started kind of attacking us and started stinging us. And... It hurt. <laughs> it was terrible. And, and, and so we took off running as fast as we could. And I'm trying to keep up with my mom. And, and, and uh, it, it was a, a bad deal. I was kind of allergic to them. I was swollen up. And, um, and I was thinking about that. You know, as, as we started being stung, we didn't stop and try to have a conversation with the bees Okay, Mr. B, that hurts. Would you not do that, please? Because I'd like to just kind of do my walk. Okay, no. We got away from that as fast as we could. And I think that's the same way with sin. If there's something that, that, it, that we are really struggling with, we need to do everything we can to put that aside and, and get away from it, to flee from that. And so that's the first thing. Run from it. Um, and then also we need to prepare for it. Prepare for it. Don't just react to situations that, that come your way. Get, get ready for them. Prepare for them ahead of time. And so they don't catch you off guard. I, I've coached a lot of different sports over the years. And, and one of the things I would try to do is to get the, the players to think about ahead of time what's going to happen in this situation. Uh, in baseball, if you're, you're, you're playing third base and there's a runner on first, you need to think ahead of time. Okay, what am I going to do if the ball comes to me? A am I going to throw it to second? Am I going to throw it to first? If it's a pop-up, uh, just kind of go over these options in your head. And so you you're ready when they actually happen. And we would practice that. We would do situational hitting and different things so the, the, the players would learn to kind of think instead of, uh, okay, here comes the ball. Now what do I do with it? And, and then it's too late a lot of times, right? And, and so I think that's the same with sin. Prepare yourself for what Satan might bring your way. Think ahead of time. Okay, I know this is my weakness. I know this, that this is what, what Satan tries to do to me. And so I'm going to get a, ahead of that. The first part of 1 Peter 1.13 says, Therefore prepare your minds for action. Prepare. 
Okay, you, you prepare for a lot of things, right? If you're an athlete, you prepare for competition. If, if you're at work and you have a project coming up, a presentation, you prepare for that. You get it all ready. You have your PowerPoint. You do different things. If you're a student and you're, you're taking a test, you, you hopefully prepare for that test, right? I learned that the hard way, my very first test of college, and, and I realized quickly that it's different than high school. You actually have to study in college, and I got a, acquainted with the letter F pretty quickly, and so, I, yeah, that was a good wake-up call. Um, but we need to prepare. And then there's this. Don't think you're above slipping into it. Don't think you're above slipping into it. I have seen so many Christians who fail because they kind of have this attitude that uh, it, it, it couldn't happen to me. I, I'm above that. You know, that, that happens to other people. That wouldn't happen to me. And, and Satan says, yeah, that's good. I have you right where I want you. Um, Satan wants you to think that there's nothing you need to worry about. You can handle it's no big deal. But there's one time that he was, Jesus was talking to um, Jews who were kind of having a hard time understanding that they weren't already good to go because they, they were God's people. They were children of Abraham. And they kind of had this attitude, hey, we're good. And Jesus was explaining to them why and how they were still slaves to sin. And, uh, you know, they talked about, hey, no, we're not slaves to anybody. You know, what are you talking about? And, uh, and he said this. And, and he was talking about um, deception um, from the devil and uh, who the devil is. And, and in John chapter 8, verse 44, he says, He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and father of lies. He's the father of lies. So people, please hear me on this. Satan is going to lie to you. He, he is the father of lies, and, and he wants you to believe that you don't have anything to worry about, that you're okay, it's no big deal. You know, we've all known people who... Uh, Basically, when they're opening their mouths, they're, they're probably telling a lie. You know, that, and you, you begin to recognize that, and, and you know that I probably can't completely trust what they're, they're saying. And, and so you learn that. You know, Satan is, is, I think, much more subtle about it. He, he is sneaky, and, and he gets you when you're weak or you're down or you're tired. Um, but if you think you're above it, you're wrong. Too many people have thought they were above it, and, and they, they fall to these temptations. So don't think you're above slipping into sin. And then another thing we often try to do, I think, is to downplay sin. And so the next one is to don't try to justify it or minimize it. I, I think, to be honest, this is one of our favorite things to do. We, we just try to rationalize or justify sin, and we tell ourselves, ah, it's, it's really not that big a deal. You know, in the big picture, what, what's the big deal? But basically, when we do that, I think we're just kind of trying to hide our sins um, from others and from ourselves. We're trying to, to, you know, feel good about ourselves, but it, it doesn't really work. I, I like Proverbs twenty eight thirteen that says this. If you hide your sins, you will not succeed. If you confess and reject them, you will receive mercy. Okay, God's ready to forgive us and help us move on, but not, he can't do that when we're, st- we're trying to minimize it or hide it or, or justify it. And so you're not fooling anybody, especially not God. And so please listen to me this, on this. That Jesus died for our sins. So when you think about it, how dare we minimize them? Jesus died. I mean, that's how big a deal it was. He had to die. Somebody had to die. Sin is a big deal. And whether it's gossip or pornography or lying or stealing, no matter what sin it is, it is a big deal. 
It's not how much you can get away with or, or how far you can push the line and, and try to still be okay. I think I'm okay if I do this. That's not the goal. We, we need to ask God to, to reveal the sin that is in our lives and, and, and then try to repent of that sin and, and, and move on. Not try to push it and see if it's, it's okay if we do this. There's a story of a man who sent a check to the government for back taxes uh, with a note attached that said this, I felt so guilty for cheating on my taxes, I had to send you this check. If I don't feel any better, I'll send you the rest. <laughs> okay, I think we, we kind of do that sometimes. We kind of just, we try to justify things or minif- minimize sin. And so sin is sin. It's all ugly. It's all yucky. And then we need to to keep this in mind also. Don't let culture decide what sin is. Do you think our culture is getting gradually closer to God or gradually farther away from God? Okay, right? Most people would say farther away from God, and I would agree. And yet it seems to me that Christians often try to decide decide what is okay and not as okay from a, a, a culture that continues to get further away from God. And so when you think about that, that doesn't make any sense at all, does it? Let me give you an example from from the latest thing that is trying to be normalized by TV and and Hollywood. Maybe you've heard of something called polyamorous relations. Okay, this is basically any kind of sexual relationship involving more than two people. And there's actually several different TV shows right now that are kind of glorifying this type of relationship uh, including shows that are called uh, House of Cards, Girls, Orphan Black, Transparent, and The Magicians. Okay, uh, maybe some of you have heard of some of those. Uh, in the show The House of Cards, it's it's uh, one of Netflix's most popular shows. And the fictional president of the United States and the First Lady are in a joint affair with one of their Secret Service protectors. Okay, and, and it, it, it's glorified. Uh, like this is a normal thing. And what tends to happen is that Hollywood glamorizes this type of thing and, and makes it seem normal. And eventually it becomes mainstream. And then Christians are forced to kind of face this situation and decide, okay, are you going to accept this or are you going to uh, be judgmental about it? And we've seen that happen in lots of different situations. And... and, and I guess I would say sin is a slippery slope. And without God and his word as the, the, the barometer of right and wrong, we tend to slide down on the scale because this is what's normal for our culture. And, and so we let that impact us. Well, God has some, some pretty strong thoughts about this. Romans 1.18, he says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness unrighteousness suppress the truth we can't let our culture decide what right and wrong is god's truth doesn't change so don't let our culture tell us otherwise another thing we tend to do is to to look at everyone around us and kind of compare ourselves to others and and it it helps us maybe feel a little better about ourselves because it's not as bad as they are so number six on the list is don't compare your sin to sins of others. Sin is still sin, no matter what. Jesus was not a, a big fan a lot of times of the Jewish religious leaders, and uh, uh, he was pretty hard on them at times. And in Luke, he told a story about kind of comparing to others and, and really kind of bragging, showing off. And, and it's uh, Luke chapter 18. I want to read a few verses there, beginning in verse 9. Luke 18, 9. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, 
but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. You see, the tax collector understood that he was a sinner. The Pharisee, on their hand, basically was saying, hey, look at me. You know, compared to these guys, uh, they're so bad. I'm so good. I'm so glad I'm not like them. And Jesus said, you know what? It's actually the tax collector that's right before God. And so if you're trying to compare yourself to someone else, you you can always find somebody that's so-called worse than you, can't you? And and, and so there's always going to be that. Don't get sucked into that trap. There's a story of an old preacher who was dying, and he sent a message for his doctor and his lawyer, both church members, to come to his home. And when they arrived, they were ushered up to his bedroom. As they entered the room, the the preacher held out his hands and and motioned them for to sit on each side of the bed. So the preacher grasped their hands, and and he sighed contentedly and smiled and, and stared at the ceiling. And for a time, no one said anything. Both the doctor and lawyer, they were touched and flattered that the old preacher would ask them to, to be with him during his final, final moments. And they were also puzzled. Uh, the preacher had never given them any indication that he, he particularly liked either of them. And, and they both remembered his, his long, uncomfortable sermons about greed and covetousness and their various other behaviors that, that made them squirm in their seats. So finally the doctor said, Preacher, why did you ask the two of us to come? And the old preacher mustered up some strength and, and then said weakly, Jesus died between two thieves, and that's how I want to go too. Yeah. Okay, probably not the right attitude to have, right? We are all sinners, and so let's not compare ourselves to others. Number seven, recognize where temptation is coming from. Recognize where temptation is coming from. We need to remember that God isn't up there hoping that we will fail. He's not putting these stumbling blocks in front of us and and, and see if we get caught up in in sin. It's not God who, who is tempting us. It's the evil that is inside of us that comes from Satan's influence. And, and uh, James, chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, addresses this. It says, But each person is tempted when you are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Okay, like I said at the beginning, we have inherited this sinful nature and left on its own, it's not a pretty picture, is it? And James reminds us just how serious this is. This is a matter of life and death. And the cool thing is that God is so much powerful, so much more powerful than Satan is. And he wants to help us. In fact, we must let him help us if we're going to ever succeed in this. So remember where your temptation is coming from. And then number eight, hate it. Hate it. I think we need to ask ourselves, do we truly hate sin? Because I think sometimes we just kind of enjoy it too much. And, And so we're not really willing to say, I hate this enough to change. And so we just kind of tolerate it. Romans 12, 9 simply says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Hate what is evil. Hate is a strong word, isn't it? Okay, and a lot of times we, we, it can be a, a negative emotion. It can even be sinful. You know, we, we hate this person. And, and we say, no, you shouldn't hate anybody. Um, but, but in this situation, this sin is something that we should hate with all of our hearts because sin separates us from God. And I don't think any of us want to be separated from God, right? So we need to to learn to hate sin and cling to what is good. And then I think it's important to keep number nine in mind as we engage in this battle against sin. That's to pray and spend time in God's Word. Okay, Jesus knew 
the importance of prayer, and, and, and this is Jesus. You know, he spent a lot of time alone in prayer, and, and he knew that his disciples needed prayer as well. And, and you remember on, on the night that Jesus was arrested and they went uh, into the garden, and the, you remember the story, they, they were really having trouble staying awake. Um, but in Luke chapter 22, verse 39, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. Okay, Jesus knew that their only hope was to to have God involved in this. Because on their own, they would be in trouble. So we need to pray about sin, and then we also need to immerse ourselves in God's word. Okay, Psalm 119.11, a very familiar verse. It says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Okay, do, you, do you see what it's saying here? If you, are, if you are reading and meditating on God's Word, if you're immersing yourselves in, in just the, the knowledge and, and knowing and understanding God and, and what He wants for our lives, it, it's going to help us uh, to, to love God instead of, of sin against God. So pray and spend time in God's Word. And then one more thing that's, uh, I think, really important here before we finish it's really important to celebrate the victories. Celebrate the victories. The danger here is, is that you just you beat yourself up and, and you get so frustrated and, and you're just at your wit's end. And, and you're thinking, I can't do this anymore and God's just mad at me all the time and, and so I give up. I can't do this. I'm a failure. And I just want you guys to know that God is not standing up there in heaven with his hands on his hips and, and pointing his finger and saying, I, you are a failure. It, that's not what God is like, okay? Um, God knows what you're going through. And, and I think that, that he's up there applauding you and supporting you and encouraging you for those times when you are victorious over the sin in your lives. You see, God's grace is about his love, not his anger with you. It's about God's love for you. And nothing you do is going to make God love you less. So please hear me on that. Nothing you do is going to make God love you less. And I think God likes to celebrate with us. And so I want to read uh, Luke 15, 8 through 10. It says, or, or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I've found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. God loves to celebrate with you. He loves to celebrate victories. And, and so as you're going along on this journey... I want you to know that it's okay to stop and, and celebrate at times uh, because I think God is celebrating too. So remember to celebrate. But as I close, I, let me say this. As I've gone through this message today, uh, there's a tendency to think about other people and their sin. And we think, yeah, this, this person needs to hear this. I hope they're listening. And, and and if that was the case, I, I just want to encourage you to stop it, <laughs> okay? Uh, this isn't about other people. This is about you. And God died for every one of you. And, and I think every one of us, in turn, needs to daily die to our old selves, to our sinful nature. It is a big deal. And God wants to help you, but it isn't about somebody else. It's about you. It's about me. One more verse as a way of encouragement. Hebrews 12, 1. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. You are surrounded by a great team here. And we are in this race together, as I, like I talked about at the beginning. And so let's all seek to continually 
throw off the junk that is dragging us down and, and just to, to lay it at God's feet. And I think God is going to help you. He loves you so much. Please don't forget that. We can do this. Let's give it over to God. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, sin is, uh, it is frustrating at times. And I read the passage from Romans 7, just about how frustrating it is. And, and, and we struggle with it. And there's these things that we struggle with, and they keep coming up again and again. And, and uh, it just feels sometimes like there's no hope. But I am so thankful that what seems impossible to men is, is possible through Jesus. And so I pray that as different people are dealing with different sins in their lives, that you'll give them the strength and to help them to deal with the, the, whatever it is and, and to help them to give that over to you and just that, that you'll be with each of us as we daily battle to, to live for you and grow closer to you. And, and I pray that you'll give us strength in this battle against sin. We love you so much, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen.